Please be seated. Good morning, St. Phillips. Good morning. It's a delight for me and for Stephanie, who's midway back right there, uh, for us to be with you this morning and uh, to be with all of you and also with those being received particularly and confirmed. I always like to uh, have a word of recognition for those involved in their instruction, which would be both Beth and also Father Clayton. Uh, and um, though it's an important ministry of uh, pre preparation, and also this morning we've had the commissioning of a catechist, which is a Greek word for teacher, a parish teacher. Uh, Cheryl is the uh, first catechist in the Diocese of Dallas Commission. So she's the pioneer. She's the pioneer. I enjoyed the adult ed session so much about questioning Christianity that I was tempted to change the sermon, always dangerous. So I have resisted that. But I really appreciated uh, that. Um, uh, it is, uh, the gospel deals with Thomas. So it's a good season to realize the gospel answer, addresses and answers our questions. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Stephanie and I live in the M Streets in East Dallas, a neighborhood known for the restoration of homes which were originally built in the beginning of the 20th century. Early one morning recently, we were walking down Belmont Street where a whole string of homes had signs in the front yard proclaiming, It's time. I believe they were advocating support for a community group trying to get some kind of new zoning connection to renovation. It's time. It's also a message we hear more widely in our culture. A political candidate might say it's time when some opponent or other they would like to have thrown out. Social media has said it recently, e exhorting us to leave behind abusive behavior. And if you're a sports fan of various teams, it's time may be your hope that finally our ship is coming in. I, for my part, want to think together about the expression, it's time, as we consider the resurrection story from the gospel according to St. John chapter 20 today. A little background. The people of God have spent half a millennium waiting for the vindication and fulfillment to come from the Almighty after their exile. Resurrection was the centerpiece of their vision of the world to come. Life would reverse death. The just and the unjust would be raised for the judgment they all deserve. The created world would still be here, but it would be changed so that now the light of God's presence would be clear to everyone. What they longed to hear, and what the, their fellow Jews who were the first Christians believed they had heard was, it's time. But we need to listen carefully to our gospel to discern in that passage, time for what? A famous New Testament scholar from England who was of the same vintage as those M Street houses was named C.H. Dodd. And he once said that there is a shape to all the stories about the resurrection. They all have a pattern. The same basic elements are found throughout. First, the disciples struggled to recognize Jesus. They realize it truly is he when he says, peace, shalom. And then he does something to prove that it is he himself bodily present. And finally, he sends them out on their mission. Those are the building blocks. In fact, you might say that all those elements of the resurrection pattern together are a recognition of the declaration, it is now time. First of all, imagine how the disciples themselves felt. They are traumatized by having watched the gruesome execution of their friend and rabbi at the hands of the psychopathic Pontius Pilate. 
And they feel sadness, also guilt and regret, since most of them fled him and denied him at the crucial moment. They feel as if their hopes have reached a dead end. But now Jesus raised actually speaks to them. The sheep recognize his voice. The word of God is afoot in the world again. And it can work its way through whatever trauma, grief, and guilt they have to make itself known to them. He is alive in keeping with the prophetic promises, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, all of whom said, there will be a time. In the same way, Jesus' voice cuts through the broken-hearted doubt of Thomas, who will expose, who is reluctant to expose himself to disappointment again. At the sound of, the, of his name, in the voice of his Lord, Thomas confesses, my Lord and my God. But time for what? Jesus makes it clear when he says to them the word shalom, peace. It was a common greeting. It was hello in the ancient world for Jews. But it had a deeper meaning. It referred to the coming world, to the kingdom. That is where shalom is preeminently to be found. Shalom is the state of being set right by your God and creator. Jesus, the word of God, spoke the world into being and now as he says shalom to his hearers, he speaks the kingdom into being for them. He's not just talking about it, he's making it happen by his word. The resurrection of Jesus brings the kingdom before us, before them, makes it collide with the old, tired, dying world that they and we are accustomed to. Jesus is himself the entry of the kingdom into this world, and you and I hear that same voice in his word and sacraments as we also go out into the world to serve. And that brings us to the last building block, the last piece of this pattern, which is the call in each resurrection story to the disciples to go out in mission. Think about that. The New Testament thinks that the resurrection leads naturally to mission. It is implied by the fact of the resurrection itself. If it's time for resurrection, it's time for the mission to the nations. The second thing the risen Jesus says to them is not only peace, but go, be sent, make disciples. We might miss it, but in fact, mission itself is a way of saying it's time. Those prophets, those same prophets foretold that someday the door would be open and the kingdom of God available to all of the nations. They would be drawn back to Mount Zion as if by some great magnet. They would see the suffering servant and be amazed. They would form the triumphal procession captives to the word of God in the wake of the coming Son of Man. Mission is what happens in Revelation amidst the woes to show that the kingdom of God has dawned. It is spiritually time. Let me go for a moment to the question that was raised in questioning Christianity, namely, how do we know? Because this passage has a lot to say about how we know the gospel is so. There are indeed, as that lesson, if you were there, said, arguments of various kinds. But in today's gospel, it is the voice of Jesus himself addressed to his own, which has its own authentic ring. They know his voice. His voice has the power to create faith. Second of all, in today's gospel, he's willing to address their doubts and uncertainties, right? He's willing to show them his hands and his side. He says to Doubting Thomas, feel my, put your finger in my hands. So the gospel is ready to address questioning human beings. And finally, the whole idea of mission is that as we follow, we come to see him, understand him, walking in his, in his path more and more. 
At the resurrection, God's time collides with the old world's time. And that happens to you and me in what the church calls conversion. You might say that each believer, you and I, are all the world in miniature. In every human soul, the same story is played out as the story of salvation history. You might say the resurrection story is the macro and you're in my conversion, the micro version of the same story. The Bible narrative, the big picture, each of us shaped in a smaller way in the same way. And that is what, is, what happens to every human being who is called, challenged, changed, addressed, and sent out by the risen Jesus Christ. And that is what we mark symbolically in our liturgy in a confirmation or reception that that change has, is taking place. Like those first disciples, you and I have our own resistances, regrets, guilts, and evasions. We can recognize these in ourselves well, in a personal way. Everyone here, we are all addressed by the risen Jesus Christ because he is not impressed or stymied by such impediments. And as a result, we know that it is he. We recognize his voice. We know that we lie open to him. Remember how in John's gospel, Jesus says that those who believe and yet have never seen are particularly blessed, and that would refer to us. He says that because we too encounter these same distinguishing messages, being uh, addressed with the word peace, being sent. We too know and recognize his voice. His word brings into reality for each of us the new world that is dawning in the cosmos. We are told as a result who we will be and who we are now in him in spite of ourselves so that you and I can live into and move toward what he already counts us to be because of what he has done. That lies at the heart of the gospel, the good news. He enables you and me to sit at table with him as on the road to Emmaus. He, uh, and by the sacrament, he is present to us and then enlists us in his mission. And when he does so, like those early disciples, he uses and changes what he finds in each one of us. All of this is to say that for you and me personally and for us together, it is also time. In your life and my life, it is time. We wrongly suppose that we have all the time in the world. That's God who has that, not us. We are given a span, and you realize that more and more as you get older. All times, however, are not equal. There are moments which are what the New Testament calls kairoi, moments that are the acceptable hour and the appointed moment. Times when the door opens by no action of ours and we hear the voice of Jesus summoning us to walk through it. We realize that we do have a God-given role, but the event and its timing and particulars and what we are called to are not ours to decide. When we are spoken to by that voice, we must answer. It is not coercive, but it is the opposite. We realize that when we respond in that way, we are finally and truly free. That is what Jesus is saying when he says that only losing your life do you gain it. And that is what the prayer book mimics that verse in saying that his service is perfect freedom. You and I come to understand this better as we walk through the door and further down the road with him. That is how we know that it is so. We value, we Americans, above everything, self-determination. We are a culture obsessed with freedom which feels less and less free. And only here in the gospel do we discover the true freedom, which is also joy. 
it is time, says the gospel to the world and to each one of us. Because it is Easter, the moment toward which all human history moved. It is time because the voice of Jesus Christ is summoning you and me this morning. You and I are given time, not as our possession, since it is all still in his hand, but rather as a door. It is, th- it is your and my time to walk through that door. That is what confirmation and that is what the reconfirmation of our faith for all of us means this morning. And the kingdom toward which you and I are led by that voice is where God's endless time for you and me is found. Amen.